let's jump into this. I don't know how many of you guys were here back in September when we kicked off this season of Bible Boot Camp, um, came back from summer break, made the announcement, hey, we're going to do a journey through the book of Daniel. And I opened this up with a statement that you're about to read the most controversial book in the Bible. And the Bible itself is very criticized. People criticize the Genesis. Where's the dinosaurs? Was there really a worldwide flood? Do you really think the universe was made in six days? And on and on and on. There's a lot of things about Genesis that people can't wrap their mind around. So that comes under some criticism. Then you get to the other end, you get to Revelation. Well, that's weird. Was there really bold judgments that's going to be poured out on the planet? I don't understand all that. Even the Gospels are very criticized. This uh, heretic, they would call him, Jesus Christ, says, you know what? There's not really multiple ways to get to heaven. There's really only one, and it's only through me, and the rest of you are doomed to hell. That can stir up some controversy. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of controversial parts about the Bible and what it says, and we get that. But nothing like the book of Daniel. It's not even close. Daniel is the most controversial book in the Bible because chapter 11 is the most controversial chapter in the Bible. What you're about to read tonight forces people to come to a hard reality that they don't like. And if you're wondering, like, I don't get it. We've been reading about the fiery furnace. Got the lines in. These are some cool stories. What's the big deal? Chapter 11. This is the big deal. You see, Daniel wrote chapter 11, um, 10, 11, 12, all come as one package. It's one vision by this messenger angel that we're going to uh, encounter again tonight. He gets this about 535, 536 BC. Uh, within, let's say, 100 years, they, uh, after they come back out of the exile, they, they basically compiled the Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament, all together in Hebrew. So you had the entire Old Testament as, a, as, a, as one collection uh, within about 100 years after that. And then probably about another 150 years after Alexander the Great, the Greek Empire, they uh, forced the whole world into one language. So they wanted to translate the Old Testament into Greek. So by 270 BC, you've got the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, and specifically chapter 11 in two languages, printed, published, and sent around the world by 270 BC. And if you're like, why are you making such a big deal about that? Because chapter 11 is going to describe things that happen after 270 BC. So this is where you get into the controversial part of it. Chapter 11 is it. Um, talked about this at the very, very get-go that uh, said it's the most criticized book in the Bible. It has been considered a fraud document, fake news as we would say it, for, for nearly 2,000 years. Even as early as the gospel period, people realized that all these things that chapter 11 had described had come into place with incredible detail. These scholars, guys with letters behind their names, Bible scholars, even some liberal pastors will say, you know what, uh, the rest of the Bible is good, but uh, you know, chapter 11, I'm not sure about. And they waver on this. They say there's no way Daniel wrote it. The future events that it describes is too precise. You see, Daniel's been given some visions. Uh, we had the metal man statue, right? They kind of describe these world empires. Chapter seven, we got uh, the four beasts. We got another one, the ram and the goat in chapter eight. You look at uh, Revelation, all the, uh, the, the end time prophecies that it describes. The problem is those are all a little vague. They use analogies. They use creatures and beasts and metal man statues. And so it's kind of vague in a sense that you have to interpret. And if you can interpret it, you can uninterpret it in a sense. But chapter 11 is not that. Chapter 11 is straightforward. Chapter 11 does everything but name names and call out kings uh, by their very own title. It's, uh, it, it's going to describe who marries who and who had uh, this, this child and son and daughter. And so it's too specific and you can't explain it away. It's going to lay out all of world history in detail from Persian, Greek and Roman empires in a way that we haven't seen so far. This is not going to be the ram and the goat, and the ram represents this. This is going to call out certain kings, as we'll see. Uh, to accept chapter 11, you have to accept it's supernatural. There's no way around it, and people are not comfortable with that. That's bizarre. Let's get a little timeline here. So if you think about the Old Testament, you got uh, it records from creation 
all the way through the call of Abraham, which is the start of this nation of Israel. You have the monarchy, you know, under King David and King Solomon. They go into exile 70 years. They come back out of it. Uh, and you get to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. That's kind of showing post-exile, that time frame. Get all the way to Malachi. So that is the Old Testament. That was completed somewhere around, you know, let's say 440 B.C., but then it's translated into Greek by 270 B.C. So every book and every chapter in the Old Testament is out there for all to read, 270 B.C. Now, you're going to read about things that happened. Uh, and the people that we're going to read about, if they had the Bible, they could understand their entire life. Uh, or what was going to uh, what was going to transpire? So you've got to have a 270 BC. When you get to the uh, the New Testament, you got the Gospels, the letters, the Revelation. That all starts, let's say, somewhere around 2 BC, the birth of Christ on. So you've got this gap of time from let's say 400s to all the way to uh, to the Gospel period that is known as the Silent Years. It's about 400 years, and people say it's this intertestamental period where nothing is recorded. And yet, if they do their study, chapter 11 describes the silent years. It's going to fill in the gaps between the two testaments. All right, let me give you just a little bit of a, a, an overview. There is this, uh, this is a little complex. I think this might kind of help us out. So there's about 45 verses in this chapter. Now, if you do any uh, reading commentaries, you know, videos, explanations of it, you're going to find I probably got about a dozen commentaries on Daniel and they're kind of split as kind of their viewpoints of what's past, what's future, what's historical, what's prophetical. Just about everybody agrees that the first 20 verses are history, that that happened in the past. And essentially it's going to go through a king's list of right after Daniel, or actually during Daniel, all the way up until the, uh, the, the gospel period. It's going to fill in. It's, it's a king's list. And this is in the study notes. If you want to go back and research this, you can. We're going to kind of go over this in a sense, but I just want to make the point that the first 20 verses, just about everybody agrees that that is history. From verse 35 on, or 36 to the end of the, uh, the book, most agree that that is events that haven't happened yet. It's in our future, and it's uh, in a period of time that, that we have called, you know, the, that's known as the 70th week of Daniel, this last seven years. And it describes, you know, uh, this coming world leader that comes on the scene, this abomination of desolation in the temple and the return of Christ as you get into uh, chapter 12. So everyone kind of agrees on the first 20 verses. Most agree on verse 36 on. The problem is verse 21 through 35. It's a little vague. It, uh, it, you're, you, as you read it, as we go through it, you're going to see where some of it seems to be describing a historical figure, namely Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, that happened, uh, that was a foreshadowing of the Antichrist, who had his own abomination of desolation, but was foreshadowing of what Jesus says will happen again. So you've got this Antiochus in history, but suddenly you find yourself in the future with the coming world leader that we call the Antichrist. And in between, it kind of blurs. And so I, I actually call this the blur because it's like, um, have you ever seen like these Photoshops that shows a picture and then it dissolves into the other picture? It's like that. So this is where people have confusion. Are we in the past? Are we in the future? So we'll go through that and try to make some sense of it. I want to go back to, um, to this right here, though. So we're going to start essentially in 539 B.C., somewhere around there. Uh, and we know we're going to get down to 164 BC, but then somewhere in that blur, you're going to find yourself in 2032, question mark. It's a specific date, right? I'm going to say 2032 because uh, we're not going to get into it this evening. However, I think there's a lot of evidence, and I'm not trying to name dates and, and all that stuff because I'm not a prophet. However, I think there's a lot of a lot of evidence that would show you that um, the Lord possibly could return within 10 years. So who knows? It could be a thousand years from now, but I think there's a lot of things. And as we go along, we might try to talk about that. But regardless, you're going to get to 164 and then find yourself somewhere in our future. Because those last 11 verses are going to describe things 
that haven't happened on the planet yet, but will happen. So we don't know when that is. Okay, remember this guy right here, this metal man statue? Uh, I have said this before, but just if you ever, uh, and let me back up a second. We're going to wrap up the book of Daniel next week and close the book on that. But you'll probably at some point in time go back and read it or do, do your own study on Daniel. When you do, uh, it's easy to get caught up in the end time prophecy, end time events. And that's a part of it. Sometimes you want to go back and just read Daniel just as a man of faith, as one of uh, the members of the Hall of Faith. Because this guy, is, consider, here is a 14-year-old who gets kidnapped, taken to a foreign country, and indoctrinated into a pagan culture. And look at his faith, his walk of faith, his dedication to prayer, meditation, fasting. It's a great, he, he stands up to a world empire, not just a small country, and not just a, a leader, but the king of the world, as a teenager, he stands up to him and demonstrates his faith. So it's easy to get caught up in the, the prophetic part of it. Sometimes we just need to look at Daniel as a person, as a human. But we are kind of, uh, we're in the, the prophecy part of it. So we've got to look at this. And I want to go back to this metal man guy here. This, you had the uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king at the time of Babylon, who had conquered Israel, taken Daniel and his three buddies hostage and taken them back to um, took them back to Babylon and put them into this uh, academic program to learn the Babylonian way. God gives Nebuchadnezzar this vision. It's of a statue, head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and feet that are iron mixed with clay that has these 10 toes. Okay, I'm bringing this up because prophecy can get, you can get into the weeds of it and it gets confusing. This is your... This is the template to understand everything. It goes back to this. If you're going to start, if you're going to study Revelation, start with the metal man statue. If you're going to study prophecies in Ezekiel or Isaiah, start with the metal man statue. This gives you the rock solid foundation. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. You've got, uh, there's kind of a, the, the vision. Go back to it. What did, what did Nebuchadnezzar get? Why did God give him this particular vision, which he then, no one can interpret it. So God gives Daniel that same vision and gives him the explanation of it. And what was it? There was this metal man statue that has these four metals that represents all the nations, the empires that are coming, namely Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. But then that's just one part of it. Because what does Nebuchadnezzar see? He sees a rock that comes and smashes and destroys the statue. And then that statue that's now crumbled and that rock grows to become a mountain that covers the whole earth. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know what that means. Daniel interprets it, and it basically, this rock's going to come and destroy all the world empires and set up its own kingdom. And there is the template. So in all these prophecies, they follow the same pattern. World empires, Christ comes and conquers, sets up his eternal kingdom. That's it. There's your template. So when we jump to chapter 7... Uh, we get a different look at the same vision. Instead of having a metal man statue, it's these four beasts that also represent those same four empires. And the last beast has 10 horns, which connects back to the 10 toes of the metal man statue. It's still these same world empires. But this is a different look at the same thing. Chapter two gave you a look at nations, empires from a human perspective. Chapter seven gives you those same empires from a heavenly perspective, from God's perspective, where the man sees it as these gold, silver, bronze, iron. God sees them as beasts that destroy the earth. And in chapter two, Jesus Christ, the rock, we realize, comes and conquers. In chapter seven, you get that same action from a heavenly perspective. You get instead of the rock, you get to uh, what I call the divine council or it's what's known as the divine council. It's this heavenly courtroom scene where God the Father comes in with all the angelic realm and gives his son authority to go down and conquer and establish his kingdom. And so that's what you got in chapter seven. But it's the same thing. World empires, Christ comes, sets up the eternal kingdom. When we got to chapter eight, another vision. 
This time, the vision, instead of all the world empires, it narrows in on just two, Persia and Greek, the ram and the goat, and you get a little bit more information. So yeah, there's 10 horns, but there was a little horn that came up, and that little horn became the coming world leader, who is then destroyed by Jesus Christ when he comes, and then the uh, holy place is restored by the Lord. Again, it's the same thing. World empires, Christ comes, sets up his kingdom. So we're going to get a, another vision. Chapter 11, or chapter 11, 12 is all the same thing. What do you think we're going to see? Well, we're going to see the very same pattern. You're going to see two kingdoms, king of the north, king of the south. You're going to see the Antichrist come. And from verse 36 on, you're going to get a, this, this, this tribulation period which will culminate in Jesus coming and setting up his eternal kingdom in chapter 12. So again, prophecy, I, I get it. There's a lot of interpretation. It can get kind of confusing. We're going to simplify it because chapter 11, you just have to know this. This is your blueprint. World empires, Christ comes and beats everybody up, saves the day, sets up his eternal kingdom. That's it. So as long as you get that, you can study anything in prophecy, and I hope that's a big help to you. Daniel chapter 11. So that's a setup. That's your warm-up. Let's go into it. I will say there's, there's going to be this history section that we'll go through, and I'm just going to try to hit some highlights. Um, all right. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Stop. Ask yourself this question. Who's speaking here? Because it's not Daniel. Remember 10, 11, and 12, all one vision. Daniel's not speaking in this vision. This messenger angel is who's speaking. This messenger angel was the one speaking, you know, uh, this, this is where the chapter break can kind of throw you off. And I get that uh, some translations, I think, have the last verse of chapter 10 is actually the first verse and vice versa. But the one speaking in Daniel chapter 10 is still speaking. This is this messenger angel, and uh, it's Gabriel or whatever messenger angel is, is speaking, but it's not Daniel. But he says, I took my stand to support and protect him. Protect who? Darius the Mede. This messenger angel is protecting a human king. Why? Why? He seems to want to strengthen him and support Darius. Now, couple things. Apparently, uh, it is in God's interest at this time for Darius to succeed, clearly, because he's being supported by the heavenly realm. Um, you also need to put a, a little time on. Remember, Daniel's not in chronological order. You have the first six are kind of the story of his life, in a sense, or the highlights, and the last six are these prophetic visions that come along the way. This happens not too long after the lion's den incident. And if you remember, what happened at the lion's den? This guy, Darius, was tricked into uh, having to, I, I want to say, D Daniel was essentially set up, so to speak, by these guys who didn't like him. And they set him up for a capital crime, which got him the death penalty. And Darius was tricked into this. And so Darius spends the whole day trying to find a loophole to get Daniel out of it. But then eventually he can't. And so Daniel has to be tossed into this den of ravenous lions that will eat him alive. But Darius makes a statement. He says, your God will be able to save you. And Darius uh, stays up the whole night in anguish over this and runs out there at daybreak to see if Daniel's still alive. And it shows you that there was a special relationship between Darius and Daniel, just like there was a special relationship between Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. Daniel was a, an attractive human being to these people, not just physically, but, uh, but spiritually. There was something about him that, that gravitated or God kind of knit their hearts together. But that's, who, that's, what's, uh, that's what's going on here. Okay, we're going to get into this uh, King of the South and the North. So it starts off, it says, now then, I tell you the truth, three more kings will arise in Persia because they're in the Persian Empire, and then a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Uh, three more kings. You've got uh, this guy, Darius. You've got uh, Cambius, Cambyses, I can't remember his name. Uh, you've got uh, Artaxerxes. And, um, and then this fourth one right here that we're going to talk about, 
this guy's quite a guy. This is uh, this fourth guy is, is Xerxes the first, and he is um, he pops up a couple times in Scripture. He pops up in Ezra, and he pops up in the Book of Esther. He's actually the king that will marry Esther. And he goes by a couple different names, but this is an interesting dude. He uh, becomes. It talks about he when he has gained power by his wealth. He was a big fundraiser, and one of the things he wanted to do was. His his father, Darius, had, um, you know, they had the Persian Empire, kind of like the Middle East and further east, but they were starting to move west. And they were moving into this area of, it, it wasn't Greece at the time, but it was uh, these little city states, one being, you've heard of Athens and Sparta. So Athens, they were moving, and his, his, uh, his father had gotten defeated by this, these Athenians, the city of Athens. These, these dudes were apparently very strong because the world empire at the time couldn't defeat them, and they got defeated. And here is his son, Xerxes, that says, I'm going to get revenge. I, and he made a vow, I'm going to burn Athens to the ground. And so he had this big fundraiser and prepared for five years to get his military up. He had a very, um, basically, there's no, there's no small city that's going to do that to us. So I'm going to go down there and, and, and light a match to it. But he had created this, um, I can't remember the, uh, the body of water, but there was, uh, they had to cross it to get over to Athens. And they created this, uh, this barge system, really cutting edge at the time. And they, they crossed it and, and attacked. It's, uh, it was a famous battle. And he, you know, he had amassed an army of, I think, two million men. Like this guy spent five years preparing for this one battle over a city. Athens, and it didn't work out very well for him, but what it did was that it inflicted a lot of pain upon Athens, and those Athenians, and in particular, a young man that will come up down the road by the name of Alexander, it lit a fire under them and a burning hatred for Persia, and he would go and conquer them. Um, this is this guy. The last, he'd be the last king of Persia, actually, Xerxes. Last rule of the Persian Empire, he's the king that married Esther, uh, took an army of 300,000 men up against uh, what would be Greece, and he was defeated by Alexander's 35,000 men. And he would be, that would be kind of the end of the um, Persian Empire. It says then, verse 3, then a mighty king will arise who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. And this is Alexander the Great, and all this is summarized in chapter 8. Um and by the way, we're going to get into this guy right here. He's, it's interesting. Alexander shows up multiple times in the Bible. Well, especially in Daniel. After he has arisen, his, uh, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. I want you to pause for a second. Now, we're going to go through this history section for, from now till verse 20. I don't, want to, I don't want to make this a history lesson because I'll put you to sleep. But I do want to hit some highlights, and this is one of the highlights. Um, Dan, uh, um, not Daniel, Alexander the Great. Something that's very interesting. So Daniel chapter 8 chronicled his entire career. And here we get another insight into it in chapter 11. Years down the road, um, Alexander will rise to power. He'll conquer all the way to India. Uh, he thought he conquered the, far, the, the, the end of the planet. He didn't realize there's this little nation called China growing, but he conquered the whole known world. But on, on his way of uh, sweeping through Europe, he stops at Jerusalem and he's going to conquer Jerusalem. And here is the, the most powerful military force on the planet circling a city. Jerusalem, they're not ready for this, right? There's no way they can stand up against the, the Greek empire. So what happens is this, uh, when they see that they're surrounded, this little old high priest by the name of Jadua goes into the temple where the word of God was, pulls out the book of Daniel, it's in a scroll, goes out to the city gate, talks to one of the military guys and says, hey, can I speak to your, your general, your king? Just give me five minutes. They let him do it. So this little old high priest walks out. He's got the book of Daniel. And he opens up and he, 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 Alexander agrees to meet with him. And he says, hey, I just want you to read this right here. And he actually sits down and takes him through chapter eight and chapter 11, in which profiled his career. 
in advance. This is 200 years later. And Alexander the Great is so blown away by that. He says, guys, we're moving out. Leave these guys alone. He was so impressed because it showed his life 200 years in advance. So this is, uh, we've seen this with Cyrus and we see this Alexander. So this is an incredible story. And that's in Alexander's words. That's not something that's made up. Alexander described that. He also describes that weeks before going to Jerusalem, he had a dream in which the God of Israel came and spoke to him that this was going to happen, that he had plans for him. So that's, that's part of Alexander's uh, journal. He wrote it. Don't know. No one knows. But this, when he read this, but notice what it says. It had predicted that after he arose, his empire would be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. In chapter eight, remember, he was described as a leopard that moved really fast. And the leopard had four wings. And that represented the four empires would be broken up into four empires, but not to his sons. He had two sons. So Alexander's reading this and he's realizing that this, whoever this God of the Israel is, that um, he had already predetermined this. So this is this guy right here. A couple things. Son of Philadelphia of Macedonia, he was taught by Aristotle. What a great teacher to have, right? Handed the throne at age 20 and conquered the entire known world by 29. This guy, that's why he's described as a leopard in prophecy, because he moves so fast. Matter of fact, the, um, in chapter 7, he was described as a leopard, which is fast. In chapter 8, he's described as a, um, as a goat that moves so fast, it looked like his feet didn't even touch the ground. So because conquered the whole world in nine years. But this is where you see just in, in kind of modern times, you see professional athletes, NFL, NBA, they spend their whole career playing a game, playing sport, competition, training their body. And then one day they retire at you know, mid, late thirties and their, their, their ambition in life. There's nothing there. There's nothing to replace that adrenaline rush from playing football, playing basketball. And you see a lot of these guys, they go into depression. This is what happened to, to Alexander. This guy was on, on a mission to conquer the planet and he did it. But then at age 29, he comes back home and there's no more nations to conquer that he knew of. And he had no more, ambition in life, nothing to get him up in the morning. And he goes into a state of depression. And what does he do? He does a lot of things a lot of professional athletes do or people that have lost their, their lust for life. He starts partying. He starts drinking. And one night he is just uh, completely drunk, walking home in the rain, passes out in his living room with all his wet clothes on, catches pneumonia and dies. And that's how he died. He actually you know, conquers the world at 29 and then dies at age 32. Sad story. The kingdom was given not to his two sons, but to four generals. He had four classmates that he grew up with, and uh, they were then given different parts of his empire. So they split up the, um, the, the empire into four sections. <coughs> and these guys right here, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy, were his four classmates that were given to him, not to his two sons. And I don't know this, but I just wonder if the scripture that Jadua had showed him about his, it wouldn't go to his ascendants and um, it would go to the four winds of heaven, if that had any impact. Or it could have been that the empire was just in shambles after he died and this is who, uh, who claimed it. <clears throat> All right, uh, that's the four winds. So... For these next, uh, next little section here, it's going to talk about this. Seleucus is one of his buddies. Ptolemy was the others. Cassander and Lysimachus were two other of the four. But we're not going to be talking about them because it's going to focus on, on just these two right here. So you're going to hear king of the north, king of the south, king of the north, king of the south. But it's not the same king because we're talking about 400 years. So I'm going to try not to bore you guys to death with all this. We're going to read it. I'll try to show some highlights. But I want to get to the stuff that I think is most uh, appealing to us. And if you want to go back and study this, so uh, just just bear with the next 15 verses. Try to make it as exciting as possible. But this 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 is profiling history in advance. And this and we'll talk about why I believe why is this in the Bible? Why is this next section in there? Why did the Holy Spirit want this in there? Probably a couple of reasons. All right. Verse five, the king of the south. So this is Ptolemy. 
basically of his two, uh, two generals, Ptolemy took what we would call Egypt and uh, Seleucus took what we would call Syria, Babylon. So you got the north above Israel, you got the south and Egypt below. King of the south, Egypt, will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance, but she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be betrayed together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. It is describing an event in very specific detail, right? Now, what's going on here? Uh, this is um, this is a lady by the name, by the way, this King of the North, King of the South, you're going to hear a lot about. What's in the middle? Israel, right? So the reason we're narrowing our focus just on not all the empire, but just these two right here, is because the, the King of the North and King of the South are going to compete against each other for power for 400 years. Well, 200 years, essentially. They're going to battle back and forth. And who's caught in the crossfire? Israel. Israel's going to get trampled. This military is going to fight here. They're going to meet and just absolutely ravage Israel. So part of the reason why this is in Scripture is to detail what's happening through the lens of Israel during this period between the Old and between the New Testament. Um, so back to this right here, this king of the south. So Ptolemy and Seleucus, their empires for about 50 years, they would kind of compete back and forth for power for 50 years, okay? So that after some years, <clears throat> it's actually like 50 years. Um, but uh, Ptolemy, the, um, Ptolemy the second, see Ptolemy, that's his, that's his son. Um, and basically the king of the north was Seleucus. He had a son named, uh, named Antiochus. Seleucus had a son named Antiochus, <clears throat> and <clears throat> Ptolemy I had a son named Ptolemy II. Bottom line is, <clears throat> they, had, they had been battling for 50 years. They're like, okay, enough of this. Let's see if we can't form an alliance. Let's have peace. So what's to do? The king of the south is going to send, uh, Ptolemy is going to send his daughter up and marry the king of the north. Okay? So these two generals battle for 50 years. They're getting tired of this. Their sons decide, let's make it an alliance. I'm going to give my, my daughter to you to marry. That way we're like a family. It's like a nice little, uh, there'll be peace in the kingdom. And this is this lady named Berenice. Now, he does it. So uh, Antiochus marries her. The problem was Antiochus is already married. So what he does is he divorces his wife, kicks her out of the castle, so to speak, and marries this, uh, this Berenice to have peace between the two kingdoms. You with me? Well, then um, Ptolemy II, eventually after a few years, he dies and Antiochus is like, okay, well, we did that, but I'm kind of bored. So uh, I'm going to now divorce Berenice and get my first wife back. So he brings her back. Uh, the problem is, um, I think her name was Laodice, the original wife. She gets even. She poisons her husband and then has this young gal killed and her young son. So she basically got revenge on the whole thing and probably got her castle back. So, I mean, uh, hell hath no fury like a woman's scorn, but that's, <clears throat> that's what it is. But again, this is, uh, this is all detailed right here, right? <clears throat> Verse seven, one from her family line will arise to take her place. Now, the family line is um, Berenice. So remember, Berenice was sent up to marry the king of the north, Antiochus. After she gets killed, she has a brother down south. He hears what happens to her sister, his sister. So he's going to get revenge. So here we go again. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some time, for some years, he will leave the king of the north alone. So the brother didn't like what happened to his sister, goes up there and attacks, steals all, the, um, all of their gold, and apparently took in this process here 400,000 pounds of gold. Can you imagine that? Plus silver and plus some other things, I'm sure. 
verse nine says, then the king of the north will invade the realm. This is after several years later. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south. So here they go again. The north's going to retaliate, but will retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army, which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. And um, Seleucus then had two sons, Serranus and Antiochus the Great, and he would attack Egypt and take that, that area of Gaza. Now, this Antiochus the Great, uh, there's going to be two. We already had one Antiochus. Here's the second one called Antiochus the Great. And secular history books are really big on this guy for what he meant in terms of like world history. We're going to be more interested in his son, uh, Antiochus the Fourth. So secular history is more on this Antiochus the Great. Um, then the king of the south will march out in a rage and fight against the king of the north who will raise a large army, but it will be defeated when the army is carried off. The king of the south will be filled with pride and will slaughter many thousands, yet he will main, remain triumphant. And he would kill many thousands, he killed uh, 10,000 men, took 40,000 captives, just as scripture had described. It's, it's pretty amazing when you go through this, you could literally take chapter 11 of Daniel and set it side by side with a world history book. And verse by verse by verse, each of these things are fulfilled. This verse 11 was fulfilled. And then uh, verse 12, uh, if you want to study what happened with, um, uh, I think it's Ptolemy Philopater III. He raised up an army of 53,000 men and defeated Antiochus the Great up in the north. And you could read that alongside a history book and see where each one of these verses are fulfilled. It's pretty amazing that God's scripture describes what's going to happen in the future and carries it out in precision. By the way, if you <clears throat> this is in the notes, but if you want to if you want to study this, we're going through four through basically thirty five. <clears throat> this is a list of all these kings, and you can kind of if you want to do your own study about which ones were from Egypt and which ones were from Syria, you can kind of study all that. Again, I don't want to bore you. I want to kind of move through here, but just keep in mind <clears throat> the reason we're talking about the king of the north south, and we're not talking about the rest of the world. We're not talking about in Bible prophecy or Bible history, we don't focus on China, right? Because there's nothing there about the, the Ming dynasty that was happening at the time. There's nothing about, you know, uh, the Incas in South America. They were there at the time. The Aztecs in Central America, there were American Indians in America at this time. We don't focus on them. Why? Because it's seen through the lens of Israel. What did this whole <clears throat> vision talk about? The messenger angel talks to Daniel, says, this vision concerns your people, Daniel, Israel, and your holy city, Jerusalem. And right now, Jerusalem is called into a 400-year war between these two, between these two nations. <clears throat> For the king of the north will muster another army larger than the first, and after several years, he will advance with a huge army fully equipped. So Antiochus the Great would bounce back and build an even larger army. and. Um, when, Ptol when Ptolemy in the south, Ptolemy Philippator, a different one, <clears throat> when he died, the kingdom was handed over to a son uh, who, by the way, was only five years old. So he was basically set up as just a figurehead. There were the Congress and Senate that was calling the shots. He was just a figure in place. Insert your own jokes right there. Verse 14. In those times, many will rise against the king of the south. This is this young king down in Egypt. Those who are violent among your own people will rebel in fulfillment of the vision, but without success. <clears throat> now they see this, this young king, this young boy, and they, they see a little bit of a weakness, right? Then the king of the north will come and build up siege ramps and will capture a fortified city. The force of the south will be powerless to resist. Even their best troops will not have strength to stand. And again, all this is fulfilled. Each verse here is fulfilled in history. If you want to study this, you can, but you're going to see it's just as it described. Okay, verse 16, the invader will do as he pleases. This invader is Antiochus the Great again. Uh, he's up in the north. This thinks Syria, Babylon. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land and will have the power to destroy it. He will determine to come with the might of his entire kingdom and will make an alliance with the king of the south. And he will give him a daughter in order in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom. But his plans will not succeed. So a couple of things. Um, this this is Antiochus the Great still, who is up in the, he's the king of the north that we keep hearing about. He, um, he goes down and defeats Egypt. Now, when he defeats Egypt, he actually got help from Israel. 
and in particular Jerusalem. So the Jews helped him defeat Egypt. So in return, he was very kind to them. So he would stop off. This beautiful land is referring to Israel. You're going to see this pop up a couple times, but the beautiful land, the pleasant land, as it's described in some translations, is always talking about Israel. And he, uh, he treated them very kindly because they had basically helped him out in this battle. Now, here's the key thing. It's verse 17. He decides, okay, he conquered Egypt, but he's going to go back home, but he needs to put someone in place down there to kind of keep the peace so they don't rise up and attack him. So what does he do? He decides to put his daughter as the king or pharaoh in Egypt. And this is uh, what we're going to see as Cleopatra. So he, Antiochus the Great, that we've been reading about, his daughter's Cleopatra, sets her up as the Pharaoh. The problem is the plot fails. One reason, well, two reasons, actually. Number one, she first off uh, was already married, and she decides to stay loyal to her husband and not to her father. Second, there is, at this point in time in history, a young, up-and-coming little country that is growing a naval power, a little old up and coming uh, nation called Rome. And she ends up siding with them over her father up in the north. And so the plot fails. And it's amazing how God orchestrates all this. Uh, here's a little thing just on Cleopatra. She would become the last Pharaoh of Egypt. She took the throne when she was 18, uh, probably one of the most famous female rulers in history. Studied mathematics, astronomy, philosophy, brilliant woman, uh, wrote articles on cosmetics and developed her own lipstick using different uh, ointments and, and pigments and had this legendary relationship with two guys, historically, Julius Caesar, Mark Antony. But, you know, one thing I want you to as we get back to this is the Bible. And when I say the Bible at this time, it's the Old Testament scripture. This was all out there. Antiochus the Great who puts his daughter down there to kind of keep the peace. She will show loyalty to Rome and her own husband and the whole plot will fail. He could have read about this. He could have read about it in real time. He could have known God's scripture was out there hundreds of years earlier. If he just would have read it and that we could say the same case for us. It's like, we're going to be reading events that happen in the future. And we have a chance to understand what's unfolding for us. If any of these characters here, Antiochus the Great or any of the Ptolemies, could have just taken the Bible and read it, they would have seen what was going to happen, how God had orchestrated or ordained all, this, all these events. Then he will turn his attention to the coastlands and will take many of them, but a commander will put an end um, to his insolence and will turn his insolence back on him. After this, he will turn back toward the fortresses of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. This Antiochus the Great... Once he, uh, he thought he had Egypt in place, he's traveling west, and he comes up against Rome, and uh, uh, you've got this, this up-and-coming nation that would become the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire, Julius Caesar, and um, so again, if you, if you want to study all that, it's, it didn't turn out very good for him. Verse 20, his successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few years, however, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger or in battle. We've... Um, Got through the, probably the hardest part, the, the, the prophecy part. But we're, we're now, the history in this king's line, try to go through it as quick as possible. Didn't want to spend too much time on it, hit some highlights. But now we're going to enter these next 15 verses. This is blurred where we sometimes do a little bit of a time jump. Somewhere in these next 15 verses, we're going to jump from 164 BC to what I think is at least beyond 2022. And, uh, you know, where that happens is up for debate. So verse 21, he will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not yet been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when his people feel secure and he will seize it through inking. The kingdom is here is talking about Israel. And this guy is going to be what's known as Antiochus IV. See at Antiochus the Great, this is Antiochus IV. And he is a, your, your translation may say a vile person. This is a bad human being. This is the, the Hitler of the time specifically for the Jews. He would slaughter 32,000 Jews. We'll read about some of the bad things he did. He is so bad that the Jews at that time who studied scripture, they were aware of God's word. They believed he was the Antichrist. There's 33 titles 
to the Antichrist in the Old Testament. Just in the Old Testament, 33 different titles. Man of sin, uh, you know, the, the lawless one. We got the, um, not the lawless one, but the, that's in the New Testament. Uh, you know, the little horn of Daniel 7, little horn of Daniel 8. There's all these titles, but they believed he was it. They really believed that, that uh, this was the end time prophecy. That's how bad he was. And he, uh, you notice it says he, um, he will invade the kingdom when his people feel secure. We're going to read that he will have a pact with Israel, just like the future Antichrist is. He's going to seem as a friend, just like the future Antichrist is. And he's going to turn his back on them and slaughter them, just like the Antichrist soon will be. Um, Verse 22, the overwhelming army will swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. And most people believe that in this process, there was a high priest there in Jerusalem that he had murdered. And uh, there's actually been letters that have been uh, recorded in the book of Maccabees between the king of Sparta. So that's over in Greece. And you learn that the Spartans and the Trojans were Jewish, which is interesting. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, um, they're not only Jewish, but they claim to be descendants of the tribe of Dan. And that's a whole different discussion as you study what happened to the tribe of Dan. But anyway, so you got, um, so anyway, you got Antiochus IV, Cleopatra, Rome, all that stuff. And um, who's going to turn the tide? This Prince of the Covenant was the, uh, the high priest. Okay, uh, verse 23, after coming to an agreement with him, this is, this is the foreshadowing, he will act deceitfully just like the future Antichrist will. And with only a few people, he will rise to power. When the richest provinces feel secure, he will invade them and will achieve what neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. He will distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers. He will plot the overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. And um, this, uh, it is, it's interesting, this, this statement here, with only a few pow- uh, people, he will rise to power. We're still talking about this Antiochus IV. It is interesting how some of the big events in history didn't take a lot of people to happen. So, for example, the American Revolution, it wasn't a majority of people that wanted to revolt. It was actually a small minority that started, that kickstarted the whole American Revolution. And there are people that have studied the Gospels and this whole kangaroo court that led to the uh, crucifixion of Jesus. It wasn't a lot of people. Some say it could have been as few as 13 people that led to all that. All you would need is a high priest or two, a few people in the Sanhedrin, and, and you got it. Um, verse 25, with a large army, he will stir up strength and courage against the king of the south. So he's going to go down the, the area of Egypt is what we're talking about. The king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, but he will not be able to stand because of the plots devised against him. Still talking about the king of the south, still talking about what it is, is Egypt. So we apparently are still in the past. Those who eat from the king's provisions will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away and many will fall in battle. The two kings with their heart bent on evil will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail because an end will still come at the appointed time. And um, we're about to be talking about this Antiochus the Great, in which is the king of the north here. A little bit more in detail. Uh, The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. Enter Israel. He will take action against it and then return to his own country. Uh, And at the appointed time, he will invade the south again. But this time, the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastlands will oppose him and he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the holy covenant. He will return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. So a couple of things here. This Antiochus IV will go down. He will basically lose in battle and take his anger out on Israel and Jerusalem. This, uh, the ships of the Western coastline, this is an interesting, your, your translation may say the ships of Chittim, but it's, uh, it's referring to the ships of the Western coastland. And um, this apparently is talking about this naval fleet that was growing out in Rome Rome was coming up, and um, the, the general of Rome's navy would come face-to-face with him and um, basically over in somewhere around Rome and draw a circle in the sand around him 
and say, before you leave the cir circle, you, you, you have to uh, make a decision. Anyway, he humiliated him. And um, this is what uh, started it all. So here's what we're talking about. This guy, Antiochus IV, they talked about him being a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. You can read about it in the first Maccabees. He's this king of this part of the Greek empire. This is pre-Roman empire. Rome is coming, but he's, uh, he's part of that Seleucus, Syria type dynasty. He, uh, number one, took out his, talked about he took out his anger against the Jews. He outlawed the Torah. He outlawed their Bible, their, their uh, word of God, made it illegal to read, couldn't read it. If you were caught with it, uh, it was a capital offense. He slaughtered pigs inside the temple. Why? Why would you slaughter pigs? Because that was the most, one of the most defiled things you could do in their temple. And I don't know what that would be like in modern days with the church, going into a church and doing the most vile, paganistic thing you could do in the church. I don't know, but that this is essentially what he did it on purpose. He burned copies of the Torah, burned it, lit it on fire, outlawed it, burned copies of it, killed Jewish moms for circumcision. All Jewish mothers were instructed by law, by, by the Torah, to circumcise their child on day eight. He found out if the, he, he, he would kill them in front of the child, in front of their family, uh, put up a statue of Zeus inside the Holy of Holies. So he actually pushed the Jews as far as he could. And this is, I'm going to put up a statue of our God inside your God's temple, not just in the temple, not in the holy place, but in the holy of holies. And that started this revolution where they fought back and um, he had over 32,000 Jews killed, but they would eventually, they, they rose up after that and Israel fought back and they, um, they defeated them. But this, uh, this event was called the Abomination of Desolation. And we're, we're going to read, we've read about this before. This abomination of desolation that happened in the holy place, it describes an event. Jesus points back to this event of happening, but he's going to say that it's going to happen again. Okay, verse 31, his armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Now, here's where the blur starts to happen. This guy, Antiochus, which talked about, he did it. But the Antichrist is going to do it again. There was a temple back then. There's going to be a temple coming in the future. We know that because Jesus and John and, um, and is it Paul all describe it happening? I'll describe it being there in the end time. So there's going to be a temple coming. There's a temple back there. He's going to desecrate it. He's going to stop the daily sacrifice. He, Antiochus IV stopped it back then, but this coming world leader is also going to stop it. So this can kind of go both ways. Uh, and they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. He did it then, but Jesus says it's going to happen again. Remember, Jesus has happens, you know, a hundred and so years after this. He points back to this saying, when you see the abomination of desolation, that's an important thing. Uh, with flattery, he will corrupt those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. And this abomination that causes desolation, 83 verses about this event that happens. You got it in Daniel 8, 9, 11, Daniel 12, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Acts 1, 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 12 and 13, and there's more. You can, you can do your own study, but this event is a trigger. It was a trigger back then that was a foreshadowing, but it's going to be a trigger to the worst period of time for the Jews, the Great Tribulation that's coming down the road. Verse 33, those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help, and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. Okay, I mentioned this as a blur. Verse 35 apparently is kind of the end of this we're moving from history. As we go from verse 35 to verse 36, probably 2,000 years goes by. You're making a time jump of at least 2,000 years because, um, because we're going to be talking about this coming world leader. And you remember in chapter 8, we did talk about Alexander the Great. It profiled him, but it talked about this little horn that will come at the end, the little horn of Daniel 8. And what you learn about in chapter 8, if you study that and go back and watch the, uh, watch the video, the little horn from Daniel 7 came from the fourth empire the Roman Empire. The little horn of Daniel 8 comes from the third empire, which is Greece. 
So you got, remember the metal man statue, head of gold was Babylon, chest and arms, silver, Persia, the belly and thighs of, of bronze was, um, was Greece and then legs of iron. So you got the, the Greek and Roman empire. So two little horns, it's either not the same guy or two views of the same guy, which is what I believe it is. So this, as we go in here, again, there's probably a huge time jump as we go from verse 35 to verse 36. Um, the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt to magnify himself above every God and will say unheard of things against the God of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed for what has been determined must take place. So why I say this is a time jump and most people feel that there's a big jump of time. There has been a lot of bad guys that have been leaders about a, you've got whatever you can, these foreshadowing of antichrist, the Napoleons, the Caesars, the Hitlers, whatever. There's a lot of people that have put themselves up as egomaniacs, right? None of them claim to be God. This guy will. This, he will exalt and magnify himself above every God. So every God, he's going to say he's above them and will say unheard of things against the God of gods. He will elevate himself above God. Now, this is different. This is not just an evil king. This is not just a bad. I mean, look around the, the, in our modern landscape as some of the guys in Russia and China, and all this stuff. But they don't claim to be God of the universe. This guy will. And notice it says he will be successful until the time of wrath is completed. There is a time of wrath coming for the whole world, but in particular the Jews, and he's going to be successful for what has been determined must take place. So from this point on, we've been going through this swing through history. Um, and just one more thing on that, it fits perfectly with the history book, everything we've seen so far. And now as we move into the future, this will take place also even though it's, it's in, our, uh, in our future. Um, and again, most scholars have this view that this last section of chapter deals with the coming world leader that was foreshadowed by Antiochus IV, and it's that foreshadowing that blurs between Antiochus IV and this, uh, this Antichrist. So here you go, verse 37. He will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors. So this is an interesting statement. Um, well, let's, just, let's read the rest of it here. Or for the one desired by women, nor will he, he, will he regard any God will exalt himself above them all. So again, he's going to make himself to be greater than any God and the God. Um, the, the thing about this, he will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors. The, the question is, this coming world leader, is he going to be a Jew or a Gentile? You know, there's some that say he's going to be a Jew because he's going to make a commitment with the Jews and the Jews are going to... Uh, want to make a pact with him. Some say he's not a Jew. He's, he's a non-Jew. But it's this phrase here that leads some to believe that he will be a Jew um, because it's the God, the, the, the God of his ancestors. You see, like the Gentile world, like the rest of us, the non-Jews, we've worshipped a thousand different gods, not the Jews. The Jews have only worshipped one God in their whole history. So uh, some, some believe that he might, so some believe he's going to be a Syrian Jew. So that's a whole other discussion. We'll get into it. Um, Verse 38, instead of them, he will honor a God of fortresses. And by the way, that's, uh, that's translated God, but in the Hebrew, it's go uh, uh, goddess, it's feminine. And this goddess of fortress, interesting. You look at every um, like female goddess, I guess that's uh, you know, redundant. Goddess is female, but uh, all, all, you know, Isis, Osiris, um, who's some of the Aphrodite, all these. They always had a fortress as a crown. So God of fortresses. A God unknown to his ancestors, he will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign God. That's interesting. And will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. Now, this phrase, a God unknown to his fathers or unknown to his ancestors, this is yet another thing of that this guy possibly would be a Jew. I mean, there's a, there's a big controversial debate. And what did Jesus say? You know, uh, you know, I, um, you know, another will come in my name and in him you will receive, which means another I'm Jewish. You didn't receive me as the Messiah. 
but another will come in my name and in him you will receive. And some believe that this guy might be a Jew, this, this uh, coming world leader, this antichrist. But I think you got, you got to keep in mind Revelation 12 and 13, that this is not just a coming world leader. It's a duo. There's, a, um, there's the antichrist and the false prophet. And one may be a Jew, one may be a Gentile. And matter of fact, when John describes this, he describes them as two beasts, the Antichrist and the false prophet as two beasts. And one beast came up out of the sea, which typically in the Bible is, is an analogy for the world, Gentiles. One beast come up out of the earth, which the earth typically is referred to as the Jews. So it could be, no one knows, uh, one Jew, one Gentile. Also, Haggai chapter 7 is a good, uh, good reference point back to that. Verse 40, at the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and, and step through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land, that's Israel. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. Okay, so this is describing this coming world leader, the Antichrist, he will invade the beautiful land, so he will invade Israel. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon, so Jordan, are going to be delivered from his hand. So Jordan is the next-door neighbor to Israel. Israel is going to be attacked by the Antichrist. Why would Jordan be spared by the Antichrist? That's interesting. Keep that in mind. There may be a possibility, a very fascinating one, coming up in just a minute. Uh, verse 42, he will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasuries of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans and Cushites in submission. And this, again, this is uh, these, these tribal names, Cushites, Libyans. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him. And he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain, Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. You know, there are some translations on this uh, verse 45. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas. That this uh, also is translated into the coastlands, the western coastlands we've seen before. There are many that believe that this chapter 11 ends in America. I don't see it like that, but uh, there are those that believe this may be a reference because one of the questions is, where is America in end time prophecy? And some say this this phrase right here, uh, I don't think it fits. So these last six verses lay out this Armageddon scenario. And let's take a look at some of these uh, in your own time. Joel 3, Zechariah 14, Revelation 19, 11 through 21, Psalm 118, verses 10 through 12, and 2 Thessalonians 2, all talk about, from a different perspective, this same period of time, this Armageddon scenario. And we might... Uh, why don't we look at just one of these in 2 Thessalonians? So flip over 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which is going to be talking about the day of the Lord. This is the Armageddon event. Matter of fact, your, um, your passage may be subtitled Man of Lawlessness, Man of Sin, because this is, this is, we're going to be talking about this coming world leader. And this gives us a great perspective of it. It says, um, verse one, now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message uh, or a letter as if, it, uh, as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. What you discover is that uh, Paul went to Thessalonica for three weeks. And so these, these are new believers. They, there apparently was a false letter that went around, and the Thessalonians are afraid that because persecution has started happening, this is when this begins. And so they believe that this uh, end time scenario is taking place. They're worried about that the rapture has already happened, and they were left behind. And so they're, they're, they're concerned. It's also interesting that he had these guys for three weeks. And yet he talked to them about the rapture and about the end time scenarios in the first three weeks. Uh, verse three says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. They're concerned that the, um, 
that the rapture happened and they got left behind. He said, no, 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 no. Okay. Okay. Let no one in any way deceive you for it will not come. The rapture will not come. The day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes a seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. We just talked about that, right? This man of lawlessness is going to come. He's going to declare himself to be God, not a great leader, not a king, but to be God. And that hasn't happened yet. And it happened, happened for them. But um, notice what it says. There's an order of events. It will not come. The rapture will not come. We're going to get into this until um, the apostasy comes first. And then the man of lawlessness is revealed. So the Antichrist comes after this falling away, this apostasy. Uh, It says, do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things. And you know that uh, what restrains him now restrains who? The restrainer. Your version may also say the hinderer, uh, he who hinders, he who restraineth. Whoever this restrainer is restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. You want to really come to terms with who this person is. It's a person. There is someone who hindereth the man of lawlessness, who uh, restraineth. Uh, but who, who is this restrainer to you? And what, and I've heard people talk about it's Michael, the archangel. I think it's pretty clear. It is the Holy spirit. The Holy spirit is the one who restrains and holds back this man of lawlessness from coming. And it says, um, and it says the mystery of lawlessness has already worked. Only he who restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. There's going to be a period of time when the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. And then the the, the Antichrist will be revealed. So that's a very key, important part. Everyone's looking for the Antichrist. Until the restrainer is removed, the Antichrist can't come. Now, let's, how does this play into uh, the rapture? Well, let's read on. Then that, then that lawlessness one will be revealed from the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and, and, and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all powers and signs and false wonders, and with all the deceptions of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. And it goes on. I'll read one more. It says, for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Here, you want to get this order of events. You want to come to terms with who the, the, this person is, this restrainer, the one who hinders. The, the Holy Spirit is the restrainer. The Antichrist can't be revealed until the restrainer is removed. That's what Paul's saying right here. So you got to get that in mind. The Antichrist can't come with the, with the Holy Spirit still here. So the Holy Spirit has to be removed. Now, the question is back to the rapture. When does that happen? Well, we are indwelt with what? The Holy Spirit. We we have the Holy Spirit in us. If the Holy Spirit is removed, we go with him. And if the Holy Spirit has to be removed before the Antichrist comes, that means we can't be here when the Antichrist makes his appearance. The The restrainer has to be removed first. And that includes us, too, in my opinion. And if you read that a different way, then, then that's OK. But uh, actually, it's not OK. But but you want to do a careful study of that. Can the Holy Spirit be removed from the earth and we stay here? I don't believe so. But one thing we do know is when the Holy Spirit is removed, the restrainer, that's when the man of lawlessness comes. And that's what will lead to uh, the day of the Lord. So go back and study those scripture verses. This will be in your study guide. You can kind of look at. Here's another important question. We talked about when will the Lord return? Here's a great question. Where, is it, where? where does the Lord return? Well, we uh, learn about in uh, Zechariah 14 that he will return on the Mount of Olives. He will split the Mount of Olives. Boom. And it's interesting that here, just within the 20th century, we discovered that scripture has been around. Zechariah 14, that's been there for more, you know, 2,500 years almost. Okay. 
about the Lord returning, splitting the Mount of Olives. Just within the 20th century, they discovered there's actually a fault line in the Mount of Olives that just so happens runs east and west. And it's just waiting for the pressure of a foot to come on it. But there's another aspect. You've got Isaiah 63. Uh, and first, let's go to Hosea 515. This is interesting because Isaiah 63 describes another return of Christ that's not the one in Zechariah 14. Does he come back one time? Does he come back twice? Here's what Hosea chapter 5 says. This is the Lord speaking. It says, I will go away and return to my place. Now think about that. He's going to leave and return to his place. Where is Jesus Christ at right now? Sitting beside the right hand of the Father. And he will go there. How long will Jesus be there? When is that time when he comes? The day of the Lord that we just read about. He gives it right here. Until. Until when they, Israel, because that's who this is speaking to, they acknowledge their offense. They acknowledge their guilt. And this word in the Hebrew is not, uh, it's not a vague term. It's very specific. It, it is, should be read until they acknowledge the offense, the guilt, and it's their rejection of the Messiah, and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. This uh, return to my place, because he's not, he is awaiting right now, and we're awaiting his return, until they acknowledge their offense, a specific offense, and uh, in their affliction. This is talking about this Daniel 9.27 discovers this, this 70th week of Daniel that is going to be horrific for them, for Israel. And it's also connected into Revelation 6-19 through 19 that kind of expands upon it. But all this describes what the Old Testament calls the time of Jacob's trouble, what Jesus refers to as the Great Tribulation. The worst period of time on planet Earth to be a Jew will be in this time. But it's to uh, force them to seek him. They will, until they acknowledge their guilt and, and seek my face in their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. And uh, talked about this Isaiah 63. Here's what it says. Remember, Zechariah 14 says he will return on the Mount of Olives. Here's what Isaiah 63 says. Who is this who comes from Edom? Remember, Edom, Moab, uh, Ammon, that's all Jordan, right? Who is this who comes from Edom? In crimson garments from Basra. Basra is the ancient name for Petra. He who is splitted in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. And the Lord speaks here, says, it is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. And when you go and you read Revelation chapter 19, I believe it is, when Christ comes riding on the white horse, his robe dripped with blood, not his blood, but the blood of his enemies. It connects to this whole passage in Isaiah 63, which shows that he will go to Basra, apparently. And uh, when back to the Hosea 515, they will they will uh, they will petition his return. They will seek his face earnestly and he will come. And this is him speaking. And he's crimson blood is on his robe, but it's not his blood. It's the blood of his enemies when he comes as a conquering king. And those two chapters, you can read Isaiah 63, Revelation 19, and compare. And it appears that Christ comes twice, once for the church and once for Israel. And this Basra, Petra, there is a 30-square-mile mountain fortress that many believe has been preserved for the Jews. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24? When you see the abomination of desolation setting in the holy place— Run for the hills, the hills, not Jerusalem. There, Petra. So some believe that this is, uh, you know, you can study that, study those two chapters, 63 of Isaiah, Revelation 19. Uh, next week, we wrap up the book of Daniel, and it's the climactic finish of not only the book, but of human history. We're going to cover it. It's 13 verses, very short chapter, but uh, it may take us the whole session just to get through verse one, but it will be the climax to it all. Check it out there.